Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our latest edition, the November webinar for the National At Home Dad Network. We are here today with Dr. Holly Oxhandler of Baylor University, and she's here to talk to us about self care for the helpers. Now, most of us being stay at home dads and, and all the other parents out there, we spend a whole lot of our energy taking care of everybody else. And sometimes we do that to the detriment of our own care. So Dr. Oxhandler is here to help us out with that. And without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to her and let her go. Thank you again for doing this for you. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Matt. I am truly honored uh, and grateful for the opportunity um, here with you today and with this community. Um, let me make sure I can get my screen shared real quick. Okay. Well, again, thank you for having me. Um, I really am truly honored to be here, to be um, in the presence of this particular group and um, to be able to be speaking with each of you today. I am gonna be talking a bit about self-care for helpers and why we need to be caring for ourselves in order to care for others well, especially these days. I'm honored, again, to be a part of this group. Um, we're speaking to this group for a handful of reasons, actually. First, my husband, Corey Oxhandler, has been a member of the Facebook group um, since his decision to be an at-home dad in 2015, and I'm indebted to this group for the support, humor, and friendship um, that you have offered him um, in terms, in, as he made this decision which has in turn supported our whole family. So thank you. I really want to thank you for that. Um, second, as a daughter whose uh, bio dad was actually no longer a part of my life around the age of 16, but as someone who was later adopted by my stepdad at 21, I really need to tell you that the role that you have in your child and in your children's lives, it deeply matters. Dads, if you hear nothing else from me today, you matter incredibly. Um, who you are and what you do, it matters to your kids. And I don't know all that you've navigated in the past or are navigating today, but I do know that the ways that you move in and through um, life and model vulnerability, authenticity, self-care and love, it will impact your children more than you know. So thank you again for taking the time to prioritize self-care and to tune in today. And I wanna thank you um, as well for all the ways that you are supporting and caring for and helping others, including your kids, your partners, um, but also your loved ones and those in your community too. And as helpers, we really need to be taking good care of ourselves and encouraging fellow helpers to be taking ca good care of themselves too. I'm sure each of us have had seasons in life in which as we were struggling to care for ourselves, we struggle to care for others well. And when we're caring for ourselves well, we tend to be better attuned to the needs of others and have the margin to care for them well. Now, before we go much further, I do want to invite us to shift from getting here, being here. So if you would, I'd like to invite you to um, close your eyes, uncross your legs, and find a comfortable position. And I'm gonna invite you to breathe in through your nose filling up your belly with air and breathe out slowly through your mouth as if you were blowing on hot soup. And breathe out. And I want you to just think of one thing in particular that you are grateful for today. Whether that is a person, an opportunity, your kids, or just another day to wake up. Be with that for a moment as you continue to breathe in through your nose. 
and breathe out and breathe in and breathe out. Thank you again for trusting me uh, with that practice. Now today we are going to be talking about self-care. Um, we'll talk about the need for self-care, what it is and why we should be even caring about it in the first place some practical steps to actually practicing self-care, and I'm really going to emphasize that it is a practice, um, creating a self-care plan and the importance of paying attention to potential barriers and ways to overcome those, and what we can do beyond today's discussion with some applications. But first, I want to start with why this is really important. As Parker Palmer notes, self-care is never a selfish act. It is simply good stewardship of the only gift I have, the gift I was put on earth to offer others. Anytime we can listen to our true self and give the care it requires, we do it not only for ourselves, but for the many others whose lives we touch. Our ability to care for ourselves well, it impacts the ways and the degree to which we are able to care for others. And I know this is a lot easier said than done, um, as Matt had just noted earlier, and you're gonna hear me talking about this with, again, that emphasis on practicing self-care. Um, in the same way that I can't sit down at the piano right now and play Claire de Lune like I could have when I was a kid, we really need to be practicing these ways of caring for ourselves, especially when we haven't been doing so for quite some time. I recognize too how fortunate I am um, that I was able to take a class during my master's program in social work um, that, uh, that focused on um, self-care. Although as someone who identifies as a helper, it's extremely hard for me to prioritize self-care and perhaps you feel the same way too. And there's always more need to help alleviate, there's more work to be done, more opportunities to care for and serve others, which I genuinely love to do and imagine that many of you feel the exact same way as you think about those who you're caring for around you. You wouldn't be on this webinar um, or engaging and selflessly caring for your kids and others if caring for others wasn't important to you. However, what I have learned over the years in both my research and in my personal life is that we cannot give to others that which we don't reflect upon and offer to ourselves, whether it's rest, presence, trust, kindness, empathy, joy, gentleness, peace, or love. We can't draw water from an empty well. Not only do we need to care for ourselves because we cannot give to others uh, what we don't offer ourselves, but because you are beloved, and you are worth caring for yourself. You have inherent value just because you woke up and you are worth tending to and caring for the gift of your life, especially as someone who cares for others. So with that, let's shift to talk a little bit about what self-care is. So I define self-care as an intentional, preventative, continual effort of recognizing that in order to care for others well, we must reflect upon, identify, and tend to our own bio, psycho, social, spiritual needs, and that we're worth caring for ourselves. In the profession that I'm in, which is in social work, and in many similar helping professions, we often talk about the importance of caring for those that we're working with or our clients holistically with this bio, psycho, social, spiritual approach. In the same way um, as we may view our clients as being holistic and multidimensional, the truth is so are each of us. Each of us must pay attention to the ways that we promote physical health and psychological well-being, social support, and our spiritual growth and development, whatever our faith tradition may be. And when we aren't tending to these areas, not only do we struggle to care for others well, but we see the major impacts of these core areas in our lives. So what does this mean exactly? Well, there are a handful of occupational hazards that we need to be mindful of, especially those of us who identify as helpers. And if we can review and wrap some shared uh, language around these terms, it does help to identify when we're starting to struggle with them. 
the most, I would say, if not all of us, especially these days, are experiencing some degree of stress, which is a condition or a feeling that's experienced when it seems that our demands exceed our personal and social resources to cope. Stress puts us in a fight, flight, or freeze response, and when we're constantly under stress, that's gonna affect every organ of our bodies and it decreases our overall functioning. Physically, the functioning of any unnecessary organs that you need to survive in that moment, um, such as your immune system or your digestive system, it slows down as other areas of our body prepare to move us to safety and quickly. So that'll include like rapid breathing and increased cortisol, our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up, and our muscles are ready to move and they're tense. Mentally, stress is going to increase scattered thinking. It causes us to struggle to concentrate. We may experience memory loss and fatigue. Emotionally, constant stress is going to result in feelings of anger and hostility, sadness or depression or even anxiety. Now, burnout is another occupational hazard, and this is a response to the chronic emotional strain of working without rest or dealing extensively with other humans, which includes our kids, um, that results in emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reduced personal accomplishment. Um, I've been hearing from a lot of parents these days that burnout is kind of where they are, um, what they're experiencing. Compassion fatigue is another, and this is considered the cost of caring with empathy at its root. It's a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who's stricken by such misfortune, and it's accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the pain or remove the cause. I think especially as we're around our kids and others, we, our empathy is activated constantly, and we are at risk for compassion fatigue. And then last, there's secondary and vicarious trauma. Secondary trauma is a natural consequent behavior and emotions that result from knowing about a traumatized event or a traumatizing event um, that's experienced by another and the stress resulting from helping or wanting to help a traumatized or suffering person. It includes the development of PTSD-like symptoms or post-traumatic stress disorders-like symptoms without directly witnessing or having been involved in that traumatic event. Now, vicarious trauma is a little bit different. This occurs from repeated exposure to others' trauma. Over time, these helpers begin to mirror the biopsychosocial um, effects that are shown by those victims of trauma. We see that those who suffer from vicarious trauma experience a transformation of the helper's inner world as a result of continual empathic engagement with survivors and their trauma. So with secondary trauma, the helper's behaviors and emotions are impacted, while in vicarious trauma, it's the helper's whole inner world that's affected. Secondary trauma, it also happens much more quickly, whereas vicarious trauma builds up over time. So this will often um, surface for frontline workers in helping professions, but I can also see this surfacing for dads and parents, especially for those who are caring for, um, whether through fostering or adoption, kiddos who have experienced complex trauma. But truthfully, while these are prevalent among helping professions, I think they're relevant for all of us, especially in this season in which we are all navigating new norms and experiences and traumas, struggling more than we can ma imagine um, and manage, while navigating massive shifts in our ways of being and without much of a break. So although we can have a general idea of where we are when it comes to each of these areas, we really need to first pause and take a look at these as objectively as possible. So I want to invite you to um, take these two assessments that I have here at some point in the near future. The first is the professional quality of life um, scale, and this helps capture your level of compassion, satisfaction, burnout, and secondary trauma. Freely available at this website, and the site, as I've learned, it also has this pocket card of caring for yourself, which includes like 10 things you can do each day to take good care of you. I also really like the rest quiz that Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith offers um, that she created to pair with her book that's called Sacred Rest. It points to when, um, to where you're experiencing a lack of rest, 
and helps to explain that rest is not just related to sleep, but that it involves physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, social, sensory, and creative rest. These assessments are kind of like a check engine light um, that indicates that where it is that we might need some help or paying attention to around where we need rest um, and perhaps the amount of attention that's needed. So once we understand where we are in terms of our struggling and to what degree um, and which areas of our lives need more attention and care, then what? Well, then, in order to begin implementing some practical next steps, we must develop a self-care plan. I'm going to dive into exactly what a self-care plan is in a moment. But first, I want everyone to feel free to switch over on your Internet browser to visit this site, um, my site, hollyoxhandler.com, and to click the button which says Self-Care for Helpers Guide. This guide it, you'll receive through email. It's completely free and it includes one week of emails from me on the process of building your own personal self-care toolbox as you slowly begin to practice self-care with the support of these emails. In addition to the free self-care for helpers guide, you'll also get my monthly newsletters that provide some resources to support you continuing this work of self-care. Um, as well as a number of resources on the intersection of mental health and spirituality, which is actually the focus of my research and my weekly podcast. There's a lot of detail that I go into in this guide, um, so I'll shift into that in a moment and give a bit of an overview. So again, remembering that we recognize that those around us are biopsychosocial spiritual human beings, the same is true for us. As difficult as it can be, we need to tend to and care for each dimension of our lives to the best of our ability in order to care for others well. And before I dive in, let me assure you that we will talk about schedules before we wrap up today too. So before you jump to thinking as I would, well, there's no time to be taking care of myself. I wanna ask you and invite you to try to hear these suggestions um, with an open palm for now and recognize that I will talk about schedules. And as I unpack these and include um, a handful of self-care strategies, I want to invite you to also jot down a strategy or two within each of these areas that jumps out to you that you think, well, maybe I could try that in the next week or so. The important thing, though, is that these strategies um, need to be feasible. They need to be something that you can do um, with you know, without taking a lot of extra time or resources, um, and that is going to result in even a slight, like five, like three to five percent growth. That's that's it. That's what we're looking for for right now. Um, either three to five percent growth or improvement in caring for you. We'll talk about barriers to these strategies as well. But again, for now, just jot down one or two things that jump out to you that you think that you could perhaps consider in the near future. Okay, that said, let's start with talking about caring for our physical health. The first recommendation that I always offer includes regular checkups with your medical provider for, for preventative measures and to ensure that your body is functioning well. If you haven't been to your doctor in a while, please make that appointment to check up with them. Other ways of practicing physical self-care may look like ensuring that we're taking our medications and our vitamins each day, moving our bodies through some form of exercise to the best of our ability, drinking lots of water and monitoring the intake of sugar or alcohol or certain foods that may not make you feel personally well. We also need to be paying attention to how much sleep we're getting. Um, my Baylor colleague, Dr. Michael Scullin, studies the impact of sleep on cognition, and it's actually pretty scary to see how much we don't even realize a lack of sleep is impacting us. He also has 10 tips to get some better sleep that I link to in that self-care for helpers guide that I mentioned before. Again, each of us are unique, and we each have unique needs around physical self-care. There are some basic needs that I've just mentioned, but again, as you develop your self-care plan, you're going to want to include whatever is most important for you personally. 
The next area that I want to focus on is our mental and emotional uh, self-care. Our mental health is on a spectrum, just like our physical health, and it's prone to illness, healing, coping, and resilience, even for helpers. In fact, while NAMI suggests that one out of five of us are currently struggling with a mental illness, some studies have shown that four out of five of us will meet criteria for a diagnosable mental illness by young adulthood or middle age. And especially in light of the current pandemic and so much that we are juggling and navigating, we're actually seeing rates of anxiety and depression in some parts of the country close to around 40% right now. And so with that in mind, my primary recommendation includes finding a licensed mental health care provider, whether that's a clinical social worker or a counselor, a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, even if for an annual mental health checkup, just like the physical health checkup you go and have done or your dental checkup that you get done. Especially for helpers, one crucial step to supporting our mental health is learning to ask for help. Burnout is not a badge of honor, and asking for help is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. And as your Facebook page um, posted yesterday morning, instead of saying something like man up, we need to be saying it's okay to talk about it. So I want to echo that here and say it is okay to be talking about whatever it is that you are carrying and navigating in these seasons, especially with um, a licensed provider. We need you to be talking about it. And a licensed provider is trained to help you talk about whatever it is for you. And if you need help finding a mental health care provider, um, I do have a number of links on my under the resources tab on my website, which you may find not only to be helpful for you, but also for those that you care for and serve. Um, of course, finding the right therapist and treatment plan it can take a long time to find, and so I do ask that you be patient with the process. Some find the right therapist right away, and for some it takes a bit, but patience is really important. Although receiving help from a provider is always my first recommendation, there are some ways that you can tend to your own mental health as well. And I don't want to skip either noting um, these particular crisis lines. Um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is so important to have, and so I want to emphasize that, that that is 1-800-273-8255, and there's a crisis text line where you can text HOME to 741-741 if you are in crisis. Now, some a number of additional practices that I like to elevate. Among those, the first is gratitude that I'll note. Um, Dr. Robert Emmons has done tons of research that highlights its positive impact on mental health. The practice of gratitude can look differently for each of us, and Dr. Emmons recommends writing down a few things that you're grateful for each day in his book, Gratitude Works. Personally, I pair this with my sleep habits, and when my head hits the pillow at night, um, rather than thinking about the things that I did or didn't do that day or just didn't you know, finish or ruminate, I try to shift and express gratitude for the things that I do have um, before drifting to sleep. From another day to love and serve others, um, to the clean water that my family has, the oxygen we breathe, the roof over our heads, um, the food in our bellies, in our refrigerator. I try to take a part of my day um, each day to focus on the things that could so easily be taken for granted. I want to be clear, though, that gratitude is not the same as spiritual bypassing, and we do not want to be using it as such. By that, I mean that sometimes we use gratitude to skip over the pain of a situation, and that is not at all healthy. To the best of our ability, we must be able to sit with the difficult, our own and others too, without brushing past it with, well, I'm thankful that at least, or anything in that form or fashion. It's not at all healthy. And hopefully it's clear how that's different from the regular routine practice of gratitude that's grounded in recognizing what we do have. Another practice that um, I like to emphasize is paying attention to the time that we spend on our devices, on TV, on gaming consoles, and more, and particularly the ways in which we can avoid or numb from the present moment. 
Um, how many of you, I'm sure, I mean, myself included, will catch yourself sitting down with your phone, you'll open an app, and suddenly 15, 30, 45 minutes slips by as you scroll, shop, check, click, and more. Not only do I worry that this is taking us away from the energy and attention that's needed to do things um, that really refill our well, but it can also negatively impact our mental health as well as disrupt our sleep cycles too. In fact, um, social media and technology are so addictive. Um, a recent survey showed adults consider it to be twice as hard to quit than smoking. Phones now have screen time monitors and apps like Moment to help monitor this, and my invitation would be to non-judgmentally pay attention to these distractions and how much time that you're spending on these devices and perhaps practice shifting your attention to the things that you value within this one precious and sacred life that you've been given. Along these lines of not missing your one precious and sacred life, it is so good for our mental health to find pockets of solitude, of being alone and in quiet and with ourselves, our thoughts and our emotions, and a pen and paper. And I know that this can be really hard for helpers and parents. We cannot write faster than we can think, and slowing down to record our thoughts and emotions and to reflect on and process them is really important for our mental health. This can look different for each of us and during different seasons of life, but for right now in this season that I'm in, um, journaling happens each Sunday as I do an inner checkup on how I'm feeling and how I'm doing. In all the ways that helpers are caring for others, we really must be creating and protecting the space for solitude um, and checking in with ourselves. And as important as solitude is, we are social creatures and we need one another for help and support. I don't go into this in as much detail in my self-care guide, but I did want to recommend um, strengthening your social support, especially during this time. Of course, this can look um, so different today because of COVID, but if we can be finding ways to creatively uh, check in on one another, whether that's through Zoom or Marco Polo or FaceTime, or even joining a virtual group with similar interests, such as the at-home dad network, um, I think these are really important ways to remain connected with others and to promote our social support. But we need to be finding creative ways to connect and to play with loved ones, family members, friends, colleagues, and more. And learning how to receive their love too. I remember there was a movie during my MSW program that I watched that was called uh, Tough Guys, and guys was spelled G-U-I-S-E. It really helped me to understand um, the value of social support, especially for men in particular, um, and the importance of even men being able to give and receive love and care um, in ways that I don't think we as often talk about. I also love and wanted to elevate the ALEC acronym that I saw on the At Home Dad Facebook page uh, recently, where the acronym is ALEC, and A stands for starting by asking how someone's doing, L is listening and giving the other individual your full attention, E is encouraging action, helping them to focus on the simple things um, that could improve how they feel, and C is checking in or following up after you chat. And so if you can walk through that, that acronym as you um, are connecting with those in your social support group, I think that can be helpful. But ultimately, my hope is that you are creatively remaining connected with your social support um, and communities as part of your self-care plan. Now, the last area of our biopsychosocial spiritual selves to tend to is our spirituality, which touches on every single other area of our lives. In fact, um, my friend and fellow researcher, Dr. Ed Kanda, describes spirituality as the core of who we are, an equal component to our biological, psychological, and social makeup, and it's how we connect with everything around us. In fact, he defines spirituality as a universal and fundamental human quality involving the search for a sense of meaning, purpose, morality, well-being, and profundity in relationships with ourselves, others, and ultimate reality, however that's understood. It connotes a process and a way of being. 
The ways in which we tend to spiritual self-care can certainly look different for each person, um, where they are in their faith journey, both positive and negative faith-based experiences that they may have had, and so much more. And I really want to um, em emphasize my sensitivity to all of these um, components to spirituality. Yet regardless of where we are, it's so important that we spend time with and tend to our spiritual growth and development which research has shown is connected with every other area of our lives. And although we can engage in our spirituality in a number of different ways, including prayer, reading our sacred texts, um, attending religious services, even virtually and more, contemplative practices are those that I most often recommend. These practices incorporate some degree of solitude, silence, and stillness to elevate an awareness of our true selves. They allow us to step out of the constant activity of our mind and spaces, quiet our mind in a way that may connect with our faith tradition and invite us to rest in and surrender to a higher power beyond ourselves, which is so necessary for those of us who are actively engaged in serving and healing this world and caring for others. There are some of my favorite um, practices that I like to elevate, and I do describe them more in the guide, um, but just to quickly go through a few of them. Centering prayer is one, um, and with this, I would recommend um, an app that's called Insight Timer. Um, you can start with centering prayer with it being five to seven minutes if you want, but eventually the recommendation is to go up to about 20 minutes of sitting in silence and stillness. Um, I do this in the morning, right when I wake up, most mornings, um, but, uh, but I do this early in the morning when I wake up, and it's an opportunity to drop from my busy, active mind to a place of deep rest and quiet within where you're reminded of your true self, where in your mind is going to want to wander and think of things and to-do lists and hop from one idea to the next, and you just let it be. Um, when you notice the thoughts drifting, you'll return to your breath or to a sacred word that you identify. Um, but I do include a little bit more about Centering Prayer in the guide and even have some videos uh, where Thomas Keating talks about it and explains a bit about it. There's also the labyrinth. Um, oh, and there's other types of meditation. Um, Insight Timer also has a number of uh, like guided meditations that you can also listen to and, and walk through if those are helpful too. The labyrinth is a contemplative prayer that's engaged by walking and it's really good for those who find it especially difficult to be still. Um, it parallels the journey of life where there is one entrance and one exit and you walk towards the core and then you, you weave out of the labyrinth walk. Um, and there are also finger labyrinths available too. So it's not just one where you can walk, but you can Google a finger labyrinth and navigate it um, with your hand. And that can be a great practice too. Lexio Divina means divine reading or sacred reading. And it's an ancient practice where you read your sacred text, um, listening to the heart of the sacred text for whatever it is that you need to be hearing through in that moment. Um, and then you reflect on it and you will respond to it. And then finally, the examine, which during an examine, this is a time that we spend at the end of the day. And we reflect on the current day, focusing on memories from the events throughout the day as a way of recognizing um, your higher powers presence in that day. Namely, you recognize a consolation during the day when you felt closer to your higher power or a desolation where you perhaps felt further away um, and to just be in rest in, in those. Again, I'll, I go through so much more detail about these um, in that, that guide. Now, I'm again, I imagine that as I've been talking through all of these practices, at some point you may have thought, well, that's wonderful and all, but I don't have time. We have kids and busy lives and things that we're trying to do. Um, and especially recognizing all the ways that you're caring for little ones these days who individually have lots of needs and um, who need a lot of attention. I, I'm sensitive to that. So in the guide, I actually focus on this instead of the social support. Because I recognize as helpers, we are always struggling with finding time to take good care of ourselves. And this is part of the process that tends to be the trickiest of all. 
What I recommend is to look at and reflect upon your schedule over the last couple of weeks, recognizing that each day is unique and um, based on your needs, your loved one's needs, the experiences that you've navigated and much more. As you reflect upon whatever the last few weeks have held for you, I want to invite you to see if you notice any pattern in how your time was spent um, and if these patterns align with your values and if any adjustments might allow more room for self-care strategies. Again, going back to just that three to 5% growth. We also have to be mindful of the tyranny of the urgent. Um, recognizing that urgency is absolutely a reality for at-home parents on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I mean, we have a four and a half year old and an eight year old and urgency happens um, and we need to be paying attention to that. However, being able to regulate our stress levels when we can and to practice discerning if it really is urgent or if it can wait is important. This also is a reason that we need to practice holding boundaries, um, finding margin for solitude and discerning how to use that time, how to use that time well is each of these is really important. But above all, I think a consistent daily schedule with regular rhythms and routines can be helpful in reducing the difficulties with transition or the cognitive load of discerning what needs to be done and when. Routines can offer the comfort of not having to think about what's ahead or when things will get done because the time's already set aside for those things. Plus setting aside, if you can spend, set aside like 15 minutes on a Friday afternoon or during the weekend to plan the week ahead and list your top priorities, that can help reduce when those surprising and stressful deadlines um, or needs pop up. Again, I know this is easier said than done, which is why we really must be creating that self-care plan. So once you sign up for those email guides, I, it will walk you through um, creating your self-care plan, including a mixture of self-care strategies that are for in the moment stress and help regulate our trauma response system. So the deep breathing that we did at the beginning is a great option for that. Um, we could also do what's called a grounding practice where we think, what's one thing I see, one thing I hear, I can taste, touch, and smell um, that brings us back to the present moment, as well as some long-term restorative practices that require planning, but that ultimately promote resilience. The self-care plan is a fluid document, meaning it's a tool to help you think of and brainstorm ideas, but it is absolutely not set in stone. In fact, you should be updating it regularly in light of the season, what's unfolding around you, needs that pop up. And as you discern strategies that really do help you and maybe some strategies that aren't actually that helpful. Finally, the self-care plan includes um, the strategy, but also the barriers and coping mechanisms to overcome these strategies. Um, as well as a commitment statement to follow through on them. So that, that helps to position each of us to better assess and discern how we can overcome those barriers as they come. Those barriers can often include, you know, struggles with time and schedule, which we talked about, maybe a lack of desire, um, maybe you need some accountability, which perhaps another dad within this group could be um, a source of support. Maybe there are financial barriers or there's a lack of access to some resources. And certainly there are many others, but if you can identify some of those barriers in advance and earlier on and think about how to overcome those, you'll be much better positioned to follow through on your self-care plan. Now, in honor of the time um, that you have so graciously offered me today, I do want to offer some additional practical takeaways that, um, that you might consider. The first is, of course, completing the, um, the assessment that I had noted earlier on. Um, in terms of the, um, the, pro quali the professional quality of life assessment and the REST quiz, um, and those will help you to get a better sense of, you know, where it is that you could potentially be struggling and, and where you might need some attention. You also might want to work um, or and I'm sorry. And in addition to this, also coming up with your actual self-care plan that's individualized and unique for you. You also might want to work with your kids to help them come up with their own self-care plans, too, 
knowing that this is a really hard season for our kiddos as well. For our daughter, when we first noticed that she was struggling emotionally um, back in March and April when the pandemic had started, I sat down with her and we brainstormed a ton of activities that she could do to help her um, be with the rising emotions and cope with the rising emotions and the grief of you know, not being able to see her friends or her teacher. Um, we watched the movie Inside Out about 30 times, and that movie was really good in helping us have some shared language about all of the emotions that we were feeling and experiencing. And we spent a lot of time outside playing in the sunlight and trying to um, do what we can to, to tend to our kids' needs. But practicing self-care for you not only helps you to feel better um, and to be better attuned to your needs, but also better attuned to your kiddos' needs, but it's also, I would say too, that this is really important for modeling for your kids. They are watching you and how you navigate hard situations in life. And pretending that everything is as usual and normal is not always the best approach. In fact, I would argue it isn't. I think it's good for our kids to see how we navigate and cope with um, and move through and be with difficult emotions. So. So I would encourage the self-care plan, not only for you, but also with your kiddos. I also want to recommend, you know, that you feel free to share this link with other helpers um, in your circles, in your communities, your small groups, online groups, and more. Helpers need to be reminded these days that they're worth caring for themselves, especially these days. So please encourage the families that you um, are connected with, the, the loved ones in your lives, um, to consider signing up for this and, and building their own self-care plan as we move through these next, um, you know, the weeks and months ahead. I also like the idea of coming up with some kind of like reading group, um, or maybe you just decide to pick up a, a, a book on your own to read. And so I do have a number of books that I like to elevate. Um, you may decide to partner with another dad or maybe with your own partner um, to do some kind of book study, to read a book together that really supports the practice of self-care. Or perhaps the Facebook group picks some podcast episodes to amplify on well-being and self-care, to encourage the dads to listen to these podcasts and maybe even exchange ideas or takeaways in the comments section. Also, it's worth noting that we've had the authors for each of these books um, on our podcast on CXMH. And so maybe if reading a book just isn't feasible right now, maybe you decide to just listen to the podcast episodes with the authors talking about um, some of the key takeaways from their book. I do want to especially emphasize um, the Upward Spiral book that you see in the top right corner by Dr. Alex Korb, which focuses a bit more on depression. And I think it's really important and worth considering in light of the upcoming months where we usually see seasonal affective disorder on the rise. Um, we're, we'll see it impacting about 5 to 20% of U.S. adults. Um, but any of these books, I would highly recommend. Further, I know um, that there is an at-home dad Facebook group, but if there are, again, if there are any emails that go out um, across your communities, perhaps you might include like a monthly self-care tip to keep emphasizing how important that is, especially during this time. I think we need to keep reminding and giving one another permission to be practicing self-care through these days. I do this with my faculty um, in the Garland School of Social Work, and my most recent email to them included a reminder to focus on what's truly essential as part of their jobs in this season, rather than trying to constantly, you know, do everything and then some. Like, there are times we just need to focus on the essentials. Finally, um, uh, I would say too, another idea that y'all could consider is to do a uh, like a quick little survey to check in and see how the dads are doing. Um, you could just make it an anonymous survey to just get a sense of the needs and, and how dads are doing, not only because I think that's great for the group to get an understanding and identify those needs, but also I think, and I've heard from my faculty when I've done it for them, that it can be really therapeutic for individuals to sit and answer some questions about how they're doing in light of so much that we're carrying these days. Again, these are just a few ideas for you as an individual, um, but also as you think about your partners and your family, your kids, 
um, your loved ones, but also, of course, the at-home dad network, too. Ultimately, though, we cannot draw water from an empty well, and we really need you to be taking care of you these days so that you can be caring for your others well, because I do believe deep within my bones that every single one of you on this call um, are worth caring for yourselves. You are worth the love and care that you give to so many others, including your partners and your kids. And my hope is that this guide provides you um, with a bit of a roadmap on how you can be practicing and considering self-care in your life. Again, here is the link to sign up for the Self-Care for Helpers guide. Um, I want to thank each of you so much um, for being here today. And I want to thank the At Home Dad Network for having me here, um, specifically as a daughter, um, as a mother, as a partner, as a fellow human being. Thank you for the ways that each of you are fathering and loving your kiddos to the best of your ability. Um, and with your whole hearts in this season. I see it and I'm thankful. So I'm gonna close with this final quote um, from Parker Palmer that I had noted earlier before, where he writes, self-care is never a selfish act. It is simply good stewardship of the only gift I have, the gift I was put, on for, I was put forth on earth to offer others. Anytime we can listen to true self and give the care it requires, we do it not only for ourselves, but for the many others whose lives we touch. Again, thank you so much for having me, and I think we'll have a chance now for maybe a few questions. Wow, thank you so much, Holly. That was that was really amazing. Um, a couple of things that I did wanna mention, um, as far as you had mentioned a reading group, I do want to point out that there is an At Home Dads uh, book club. Uh, granted, at, at the moment right now, believe it or not, we are actually focusing on uh, 1984, which is probably not the most stressful <laughs> reading book to be reading. <laughs> but we are, we're always looking for a new book to read next. So, you know, okay. if guys want to be a part of that, please, by all means, reach out. We're always looking for more guides to join us with that. Um, in the past, I know that uh, the National At Home Dad Network early in the pandemic was doing a lot of uh, like Zoom social hangouts. Um, I, I, I was not the one handling that. That was uh, mostly uh, Brock Lush who was uh, running that kind of thing. But I think that this is something that we should probably start putting together again to get the guys just because it's nice to be able to type back and forth on Facebook. But sometimes it's a lot nicer to be able to look somebody in the eye. Okay. Now, that. a couple of questions that I have. Um, you know, you were talking about some of the symptoms of stress. And I know that lately I I've been having a very, very strong, like, anger, anxiety reaction to stress. Um, it, it reaches a point where, you know, the kids start yelling and my body literally goes into sensory overload. Yeah. Um, and I've gotten better about handling it in the moment, but a lot of times I just have to walk away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and make and get myself together before I can come back back out. Do you have any advice on a, a, a way to better push past that in the moment? Because I mean, I hate to walk away from my kids, especially when they're upset, but I can't do anything for them when I'm in that state. Yeah. God, I love that question, Matt. And I think you are not alone in any, I mean, I think this, uh, yeah. Especially when there isn't a whole lot of margin these days with the kids being away. They're not in school. They're around us all the time. And so I think finding ways to, um, to, to navigate that is really important. So thank you for the question. I think if you are feeling, if the stress is getting to be too much, I think it is okay sometimes to just walk away for a moment and to give yourself what you need to, um, to be present, to calm down, to take some deep breaths. I think that that is 
great. I think having reminders, I know we're big, I mean, I have like notes, little reminders all around our house that has like, you know, take a deep breath, slow down, you know, listen, you know, just some of those reminders that I think we can take for granted at times, but they can be helpful so that it's not when we're in the moment where our kids are losing their marbles that, you know, we're trying to calm back down. Um, but deep breathing would be one and using the deep breathing practice I mentioned earlier with breathing into your belly and breathing out like slowly, like as if you're blowing on hot soup. There's also something called progressive muscle relaxation that we um, talk about in mental health care where you can practice by like tensing your muscles and relaxing them and like, you know, you can fist and then relax and that that helps teach your body to know the difference between tension and relaxation so that you start to notice your muscles tensing before you're at the like, I'm just over it moment. Does that make sense? No, it um, makes complete sense. Yeah, so I think that's helpful. And then I know I talked about some um, contemplative practices earlier. I think if, I know it's really hard to wake up before the kids wake up. Like, I know that that's hard. I know it's hard. <laughs> I know it's hard. I know. Um, I think if it is possible to try to find a little time in the morning to wake up and fill your well before the kids get up, I think that can help to build a little bit reserve during the day so that um, it's so that you can have a little bit more margin of discerning when to step in, when to walk away, when the kids start kind of going a little bonkers. So, yeah. So good one of the other questions that I have, and uh, th this might be something that you can answer from experience, not, not just from an academic perspective, mm -hmm. is that one of the issues that a lot of dads have, and you've made mention of this, is that, you know, there's that whole man up mentality where they, yes. you know, you don't want to show anything that could remotely be taken as a sign of weakness. And most that's changing, luckily, but it's still an issue. Yes, it is. Yeah. One of the biggest problems that I run into is my my wife works really hard. Um, mm -hmm. She she really does. Um, she works really hard to take care to make the money that we need to take care of our family and live our lives. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for me to look up at the end of the day when she comes in after a hard day of work. And look at her and say, okay, now I need you to take an hour with the kids because if I don't get away, yeah. I'm going to snap. I mean, is is there a better way to say, I know you've been working all day, but I need a break from this because my shift doesn't end. Yeah. You know, I mean, that that's a really difficult part. And um I wish I could find a way to say it where I don't feel guilty for asking. Yeah. Yeah, I I I hear you. I mean, it's certainly part of our home too where my husband and I, you know, as I mentioned, he's an at-home dad and um you know and and I am the one that is working and he's with the kids, but I know that he feels that too. Those those days where it's really hard where he doesn't want to ask for help, but he needs to, and trying to find that balance is really tricky. I think communication is so important between partners and constantly recognizing, like, for you in your role to spend time and think about what it is that you need and what is going to fill you up the most that isn't going to numb or, you know, just kind of like take away from the moment, but really will fill you up. If I think if you can communicate those things clearly to your partner and um, and ask her, you know, these are the things that I need, can you help in these areas? Can we create these rhythms or rituals or, you know, the schedule that I had talked about earlier where, you know, you get, you know, whatever it is, where whatever works for y'all, where when she's done with the day, maybe she spends 10 minutes just getting out of work mode and focusing back into home mode. And then as soon as she's in home mode, you can tap out for a little bit and be able to like take care of you, step outside, go for a walk, whatever. 
Um, I think that communication is really important. And and you're right. I think um, the, some of the toxic masculinity messaging around like um, you just needing to keep going and work harder and white knuckling through it or asking for help as a sign of weakness. I mean, that is not serving us well. We have to be able to shift that narrative. Our kids need to see their dad saying, I'm struggling. Their kids need to see our mom say, I'm struggling. And not that our kids need to take on our struggles, but they need to see how we are human and we cope with that humanity and difficulty and how we cope with it in partnership with one another as a couple. So um, those are a few thoughts that I have. But I think, again, as, as you can better articulate and identify what fills up your well, um, you know, what are those self-care strategies? I think that will help so that, you know, your wife, I would absolutely imagine, would be like, yes, you need that. Let's let's build that in. We need that because you taking care of you impacts the whole family, you know? I mean, yeah. 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 I'm yeah. So at, at this point, um, we'd love to open up the floor. If anybody else out there has any questions, um, you're welcome to type it into any of the live streams. Uh, we're currently live streaming in at least two or three different places. Um, I haven't gotten any. I know uh, we did have one person ask if they could post the website again, and you did that earlier. <laughs> now, the ProQOL test, was at the ProQOL.com? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's correct. And the rest quiz was at restquiz.com. That's correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure that we got those out there yeah, for anybody good. that was looking. No, that's good. I think they both, I know the rest quiz is for sure on the um, emails that self care for helpers guide has the rest quiz link. I think the professional quality of life one is too, but I can't remember off the top of my head, but those are the two websites that you mentioned. So, okay. Yeah. Well, look, thank you so much for your time. I, I do want to reach out to everybody watching and remind everyone um, this is the month of November. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, it is also referred to as Movember, which explains this ridiculous thing on my face. <laughs> um, we There's a whole group of guys all over the world that are growing mustaches, beards, moving around, all to raise awareness of men's health. And there's no two ways about it. Mental health is health as well. Amen. Um, it is a large, large problem all over the world. Um, I read a statistic the other day that was telling me that uh, men are 3.7 times more likely to take their own lives than women in this country. Yeah. Um, if you're hurting, please reach out and get help. Um, there's plenty of help out there available for people who need it. Whether you do that through one of the hotlines, through professional help, or honestly, just reaching out to a friend or a family member can make a huge difference. Um, as isolated as we are right now in the middle of the, of the pandemic and everything else going on, we're not alone. Um, we're more connected than we've ever been before as, as a species. So there's no excuse not to reach out. And, uh, you know, on that serious note, um, I want to thank you again for coming out to join us. Um, we really appreciate it. I hope some guys can take advantage of everything. And uh, to all the people who are watching this uh, on a recording and not live, um, feel free to go to Dr. Oxhandler's website. And I'm sure that there's information there as well as email addresses so that if they have any direct questions, they can easily reach out to you, right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on today, Matt. It really has been a pleasure. And again, it's it's an honor, especially knowing this group and the role that y'all have had in our family's lives. So thank you so much for all you do. Well, thank you. And on behalf of the National At Home Dad Network, we thank you all for joining us. Uh, we are going to be taking December off 
from doing a webinar. Uh, we figure everybody's going to have enough going on with the holidays that carving out an hour or so of time in the middle of that seems a bit much. So we will see you guys all again in January, and uh, we'll be announcing what our January webinar is soon. Thanks so much, and have a great day. Thank you.